my name is Cameron Braithwaite. I'm a footwear designer. I design running shoes for 361. This is the culmination of a lot of work with, from a lot of people. You know, it's fun to see it done and be able to run in it. Now that it's in production, there's sizes that I can actually run in. Before, I could try on a pair, but they were too small, so I couldn't run in them. So I'm excited now so I can go try them out and run in them and, and see how they feel. Uh, the first time I tried it on was when we were in production, when we were making it. So when we were designing it, they would do pullovers and we'd put them on and I'd try to see how the laces were lacing up. Um, it always felt good. The, important part from the very beginning was working on the last so that the shape was good. So when you put it on, you should notice it has a real cool toe spring. Yeah. Um, and that was part of the development we did early on. So a lot more work if you do stuff early on, the later down the process, the better the shoe is. The word joy ride is really just two words, right? Joy, mm -hmm. which is like happy and ride yeah. is how it feels. We named it that because the experience you have when you ride in the shoe. It should be a joyful experience, it should be fun. There's a ton of technology in the outsole and the midsole. Most of it comes from the sculpting, so it releases on the lateral side, on the outside, and then it's more stable on the medial side. But there's also lots of different components in this that are in uh, professional running shoes. So there's blown rubber forefoot, which this is cushioned rubber, and then it has the TPU in the midfoot for stability. Different parts do different things. This is all carbon rubber, which is hard and durable, which mm -hmm. is in the back, uh -huh. because this is where you have a lot of impact. So there's this uh, strap, this inner strap, that's kind of built into the shoe, and mm -hmm. it's connected down here at the strobel board, down at the, okay. at the midsole. But this helps actually lock in the middle of your foot. This is one of the most important things about a, a good running shoe is, you don't want your foot to slip around here. Every single person's foot is a little different, but this helps adapt to the foot so that it'll fit everyone well. Yeah, it's a great shoe. I would uh, say it's very stable, it's got lots of cushioning, and it's super comfortable. So it would work great for running a marathon. I mean, you could run a marathon in it, but it'd be a great training shoe. You could use it to build up miles. I've seen uh, racing shoes that are designed to only run a marathon, and you run in a marathon, and then afterwards you throw it away. Because oh, really? it's completely destroyed, yeah. But the foam and the construction of this is you can use it to train in, you could use it to put miles and miles and miles on. Yeah, I mean, when we were, when we were developing the shoe, you know, they'd make pullovers. One of the things that makes a great running shoe is making it breathable. So it's got to have air coming in and out. One of the things I was concerned about is when you have too many layers, when your foot gets hot, it won't breathe. So we, we used, you know, special venting materials, um, open mesh, so that when you're running in it, you're, the heat can dissipate. So you know, one of the things that we always do is when they give us a sample, we, we try to cut it and make sure how is this going to breathe, how many layers is right here, you don't want irritation. So it's one of the things that you do, Just you just learn from experience is, you know, trying to figure out how to make the shoe the, the way it's supposed to be made so that it functions the right way. That's probably a good question. I don't know. I think that probably the main difference is the companies I worked for before, they were in the United States, mm -hmm. and we would work with our counterpart in Asia. The difference with working with 361 is they're in Asia. So when we work together, faster turnaround, things can get done quicker. Uh, I think probably a little bit more intelligent answers, mm -hmm. just because they're, they're the ones actually building the shoe as opposed to the communication between the two countries. Yeah, I mean, I think it's super important when you go, every time I come visit, we go and look at things that that we're already working on, things that we're trying that, you know, maybe future down the road projects. Mm -hmm. uh, right now we're working on stuff that's going to be done in a year, year and a half, but it's important to always look and see what's going on. And factories are really the ones on the ground doing the research, doing the development. So it's great to ask them questions and get the, the real answers. So each person has an expertise, right? So there's people that just work on the tooling part. And there's people that work just on the foam part, um, there's people that work on materials, there's people that work on uppers, and they work with those things every single day. So if I have an idea and I think it might work, yeah, sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. So when you work with, with these people that have specific expertise in their field, sometimes it's great to say, look, I know this is how we've done it before, but I wanna try something different. Let's push the boundaries, let's, make, let's feel a little bit uncomfortable, let's go try something. And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But I think the most important thing is to work together 
and to be try to, to try to be creative and, and to push the boundaries a little bit so that you're not just designing and developing the same thing over and over and over again. You want to become, you know, if you want to become a leader in footwear or in anything in life, you have to try and feel a little bit uncomfortable. If you're doing something in life and it just feels the same every single day, then you're not really, you're not really progressing. You're not be, being creative. You're just doing the same things over and over. Usually we start with the tooling. The first thing you start with when you're doing the tooling is the last, right? We started with the last, which is funny because that word means last, but it actually goes first. The, the part that you want to work on most is getting the silhouette, the form that they build the shoe on. You want that to actually fit the majority of people. And you know, one of the things I first learned when I started working with 361 is that the foot shapes of people that live in Asia is a little different than people that live in the U.S. So a lot more research went into finding a last and shaping the last so that it would fit the majority of people here versus versus there. So we started with that, but I think the first thing that we worked on when we started with this midsole and with this outsole was flexibility. The reason why all this rubber is cut out here and the gaps between the rubber here are wider than they are here is to make the shoe more flexible, especially on the lateral side. So flexibility is a big deal. We worked on, on this piece in particular uh, quite a bit. We opened lots of molds trying to get this piece exactly right. So you'll see a lot of shoes where the heel rake or the back of the shoe, it, it stretches out quite a distance. In professional running shoes, you actually bring the heel in closer so that the middle of your foot is, it's called joint centers, right underneath your foot. So we worked really hard on this. So if you look at it, if you go from the medial side to the lateral side, it actually sculpts in as it comes around so that it can release on this side and not release on, on the medial side. It looks really simple, but it took us a while to get it right. There's two different sides of that coin, right? If you made a shoe and it, and it functioned perfectly, but it looked ugly, no one's going to want to want to buy it. I mean, people don't like buying things that are ugly. So you always have to think of those two sides. You want the shoe to function properly, but you also want it to have a, a neat aesthetic. You want it to look aggressive, like it has some speed to it. Um, so there's a balance there. I think if you do too much, let's say you design a shoe that just looks really, really cool, but it doesn't function well, then you've failed there too. So it's a balance. You've got, it's probably a 50, 50 balance. You want it to look nice, and you know, like, like we were talking about earlier, it has neat colors and it has some neat shapes on it, but if it doesn't function, then you know, you could put it on, but you couldn't run in it. What's the point of buying a running shoe if you can't run in it? Music? Well, I'm an old soul, so I like to listen to a lot of old stuff. We were actually listening to Linkin Park the other day while, while we were in the office, so I like all types of music. Sometimes it's nice to listen to easy music, sometimes it's nice to listen to loud and rock music, so. Just depends on how I'm feeling at the time. Yeah, we have, um, well, we're working on stuff right now that's a little different than this shoe. This is just our first shoe that we've mm -hmm. done together, but we have, right now we're working on eight different shoes. Okay, and eight a lot different of, shoes. Yeah, a lot of them have different uh, instructions and technologies, and those will be coming out in the near future. Well, first when we start out, we brief the shoe. Mm -hmm. So there's a process of determining who the shoe is for and what's the, what's the product use. Um, and so each of those are different, you know, you don't design them all for the same people, but you have, you want to be able to reach a broader base of consumers. So yeah, we have different shoes for different, different services and, and they'll be, you know, for different age groups and different activities. Yeah. So like you said, there's definitely fundamentals. There's, there's a building block and you build it off the base. So, you know, the, I think the number one thing when you're designing a, a shoe is determining who is it for? Is it for a stability runner? Is it for a neutral runner? Is it a racing shoe? Is it a marathon shoe? So you have to find out, you know, what the shoe's purpose is and then build it from there. So there's just certain things you don't change because you know that they function a certain way. That's why a lot of really great running shoes, when you put them on, will feel really comfortable. They say that the best walking shoe is a running shoe. You want, they want the shoe to be there so that it, it cushions, you know, your foot, but you also want it to almost feel invisible. So you want it to be there so that it can help you run a longer distance. I mean, imagine running without any shoes on after a while would just hurt your feet. So yeah, the running shoe there is just, it's, it's, it's supposed to allow your body to be able to do what it needs to do, but protect it from getting hurt. So there's definitely fundamentals. There's, you know, cushion thickness, there is, you know, sculpting, there's materials, um, material locations. I mean, one of the reasons why we don't have a, a big piece of material here and you have breathability here is because that's where your foot's flexing and putting off the most heat. So 
It's all about understanding how the foot works. Yeah, my life is made up of millimeters. Some people, you know, worry about things in inches or miles. For me, it's millimeters. You know, to get something something right, let's say, let's say we open the blueprint. The blueprint says this is supposed to be, you know, 20 millimeters tall. So one of the first things you do is you check it from the real version of the shoe versus the blueprint. You want to look for any indiscrepancies, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that when you're designing a professional running shoe, when you do a really good job, you check everything, measure it, make sure it's all within the tolerances of production so that when they make it, it'll work the way that it's supposed to work. Millimeters make a difference. Anyone can really design it. It's not really rocket science. You just have to learn how to do it. But to be, I think, really good, to be proficient, um, I think that the first thing you'd want to be is creative. Um, the second thing you'd want to know is biomechanics. So that is understanding how the foot interacts with the shoe and how the shoe interacts with the ground. Okay. So there's a lot of research that takes I mean, years and years. I'm still learning things about biomechanics and I've been learning about it for you know, the last 10, 15 years. But I think the third thing is Whatever shoe you're trying to design, let's say it's a basketball shoe or a, a cross-training shoe, it's important to be able to put the, the shoe on and perform the activity it was designed for. So if I'm designing running shoes, it's important as a designer to put on the shoe and go running in it to see how it feels. Same with basketball, same with any sport. I come across designers all the time and um, you know, let's say they're a basketball shoe designer and I say, well, how does it work? How does it perform? They say, oh, I don't know, I don't play basketball. And I said, you got to go try it out. You know, you can only learn so much from reading or learning from other people. You got to put it on and try it out. I think most running shoe designers, do, the run. reason why they do it is because they like to run. But yeah, I mean, it's important to be able to do the activity that the shoe is designed for. If it doesn't work well, then you failed as a designer. When you're building um, a design, it, you know, it's the first part, the easy part is always just drawing it, mm -hmm. you know, coming up with a neat idea. And then from there, you have to actually make it a process of what the shoe is made of, you know, each part of these has a different piece of material in it. So you have to make what they call a shell pattern. And it actually looks a little bit like this, but it's done like a butterfly. The back of the shoe is seamed underneath this piece. And when you lay it out, it's flat like this. And then they build it flat and then they wrap it around. They wrap it around like this and then they seam it in the back. So when you're doing the shell pattern, you have to determine you know, where the eyelets go, how far they're spaced out from each other. You know, you have to worry about which pieces go in which place. Um, and then when they build the pullover, you try it on, you make adjustments. You know, maybe this is too wide down here. Maybe you want it wider. Maybe this opening is too small and you need to make it larger. Maybe you have heel slips, so they have to adjust the pattern. So you go back and forth with the shell pattern, trying to make the shoe fit as well as it can and function the best way that it can as well. So it's, it's fun watching them make it because, you know, people, when you go to the store, you know, you see the shoe and it looks like this, but it takes so much more thought than just, you know, putting the shoe on the shelf. You know, when they build it, you have to worry about where it's, how it's being stitched. When they do stitches done by hand, and they put this, this uh, TPU, this film on here, and that adds structure and how that's done with heat and pressure. So it's all done in a, in a step by step process. And it, at the end, you know, when it fits and works well, that's, I think that's the, the part that makes designing shoes the most rewarding. So when I get up in the morning, I usually go, I'll exercise or I'll go for a run. So it's fun to see what type of people are out in the morning doing exercise. You know, there's a lot of people that are out in the park and they're either doing stretches or they're doing badminton or they're doing Tai Chi. But there's a lot more people I see running now than I ever saw before in Asia. So I think, because I've been coming to Asia for what, 18 years, and I'd say in the last three or four years, you see a lot more people running. So when I'm running, uh, when I see people running, I always give them thumbs up. I think that there's a shift in the mainstream of, I think, just society in general throughout the, the whole world mm -hmm. where exercise and fitness is becoming more important. Yeah, I've never been to Chengdu before, so this is my first time. I'm excited to see the pandas. That'll be fun. Um, you know, running in marathons is a lot of work. These people that come from all over the country to come run, they've been training for months, years maybe. Mm -hmm. Some people will be their first marathon. Some it'll be their 10th, 20th. I mean, some people run, you know, a marathon once a year, which is great. So the atmosphere is always exciting and it's always fun to see people running and being, you know, active. So, I mean, it's obviously different, right? Mm -hmm. Living in the United States or living in China, it's, it's, it's a different culture. But I think the part that I like about coming to China is people are always very nice, you know, and they're very hard workers.
not to say anything bad against the U.S., but uh-huh. but um, you know the culture here Different is style. yeah is is work hard and the kindness I think is very nice too. So when I come, I always feel welcome and and uh, we get to work and work hard. <laughs>